Hello, and welcome to the second episode of the Reviewing the Realms podcast, a science fiction and fantasy literature podcast. I am your host, Zach, and today we'll be looking at the book The Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. So I got some feedback from the episode last week about how the format of the show goes, and so I've decided, thanks to that feedback, to uh, switch up how the episodes go. So I'm going to talk about the plot first, and then talk talk about the physical features of the book, and then anything else of note uh, that goes along with the book. So that's how I'm going to separate the different sections out. If you want to give the show feedback, you can reach me in a bunch of different ways. You can email the show at reviewingtherealms at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Reviewing the Realms, and you can also tweet at us at Realms Reviewing. So, The Children of Blood and Bone is a 2018 fantasy novel uh, published by Henry Holt Publishing, which is a division of Mac... Millen Publishing, and let's get right into the plot. So, the story takes place in a land called Orisha. Before the events of the book, there was uh, essentially, like, two types of people. There were people who could perform magic and those who could not. And the magic uh, wielders of this Orisha land were called Magi. And there were several different types of magic that they could perform, um, from elemental manipulation, so they could control fire or water or earth, uh, to seeing in the future, uh, to mastery over, like, death. The one thing that is kind of unique about the magic system in the world uh, is that magi only have control over one of these elements. So if you are a fire magi, you can't go and then learn water powers which I think is kind of cool, but they do explain why that is. So essentially, the Magi are getting their powers from a deity that they pray to. So in a sense, they're kind of wizards, but they're also priests. If we're looking at this at, in a traditional kind of D&D role type situation, I, I guess that was a little bit more complicated than I was thinking it was going to be. So the Magi and the non-magical force uh, folks of uh, Orisha lived in, in a kind of uneasy harmony for a while, but the king of Orisha, this guy named King Saran, came fearful of what the Magi might be able to do if they wanted to use their powers in order to overthrow his government. So he discovered a way uh, that's revealed a little later on in the book to wipe out the power that the Magi had. Have, and he then went and slaughtered all of the existing magi. And the remaining magi um, were children, and they are kind of subjugated to abuse by the government of King Saran. And that leads us to our main character, who is a girl named Azeli, I believe is how it's pronounced. She is in a village that is constantly being taxed by King Saran's men, and the taxes keep going up. And they're unable to keep up with the pace that the taxes are increasing. So, um, Azeli's family is actually a family of fishers. And so they were able to find this really expensive fish. And Zeli uh, goes and tries to sell this fish in the capital city. Now, this is dangerous for her to do because she is the child of a magi. And magis have, the, have this uh, long mane of straight white hair. It makes them stand out instantly. But she's successful in selling this fish and she's able to get a good price for it. Enough money that will last her family a good few years, um, even with the increased taxes all of the time. And as she's leaving, um, she's approached by this girl in a cloak. And the girl in the cloak has this um, scroll, and she asks for Zelly's help. And Zelly's like, not really into helping this girl at the moment. She's like, I want to go home. I don't want to get involved in anything that will be dangerous. But uh, she touches the scroll, and she starts to feel these this warmth in her body, and she decides that she needs to help this girl. So she takes the girl in the cloak and they leave uh, the, and they escape the city. But it's quickly uh, revealed that the girl in the clo cloak is actually the daughter of King Saran, this girl named Amari. And the scroll that she has is something that will actually bring, ma could potentially bring magic back to the world. And so Zeli, her brother Tizain, or Tanzan, and Amari go and try to set about bringing back magic to the world of Orisha. So that is the plot of the book in a nutshell. Physical features. So one of the things that really draws me to a book is the cover. I, I know they say never, uh, never judge a book by its cover, but the cover is the first impression that any book gives its reader. 
So if it has a good cover design, then a reader is more likely to read that book than one that is kind of poorly designed. So the the, the dust cover jacket design of the hardcover edition of Children of Blood and Bone is fantastic. I don't actually think there's a paperback edition quite yet because the book is less than a year old or just about a year old. It pictures Zelly, or who I believe is Zelly, from a view of just above her nose, so you get her eyes and her long white hair billowing back in the wind, and it's just really a, a powerful looking image, something that will go, hmm, I wonder what this is about. And also the title itself, The Children of Blood and Bone, is intriguing to say the least. But I'm one of those people who, when they're reading a hardcover book, takes the dust cover jacket off. I find that it gets in the way of when I'm reading, like it's like slipping and I'm constantly adjusting it. So I just take it off. And then uh, unfortunately, I'm also one of those people who tends to lose the dust cover jacket. But the people over at Macmillan Publishing had me covered this time because the front cover of the physical hardcover is beautifully designed as well. There's actually an embossed image in gold of a sword and a gem, kind of like a compass, and it's really elaborate. And then the title itself is embossed in silver beneath it. It just, it looks really nice. And then if you put it spine first, there's some filigree above and below the title. So it just, it just looks like a really, really nice package, uh, all things together. The book is about 530 pages, including author notes and, and acknowledgements. And the inside covers also have of illustrated maps of the world, which I really enjoy when books give you those maps. Sometimes I would, and it depends on where they're placed in the book. So in the case of the, in the case of Children of Blood and Bone, it's on the uh, inside cover and the first page before you get to the title page, and then the back cover and the and the sec and basically the last page of the book uh, has uh, the maps on it, and that makes it look really really nice. And I actually found myself using the maps because even though they're either a few hundred pages behind or ahead of where I was at, it was just really simple for me to flip over and look at the maps. Sometimes when they're like in, like they're like a few pages in, I don't necessarily look at the maps, even if I, even if I would find it helpful because it's just not as easy to flip back and forth between that. The font size is a pretty good size, so it's not like cramped. And 530 pages, it's nice and spaced out. And also, the chapters tend to be less than 20 pages. So that also helps when you want to read and you may have a little bit of a short attention span or something along those lines. 20 pages or less, and then you're on to the next chapter, which I find really, really helpful. Okay, so I said that there was going to be a couple of other factors to talk about in this book. So let's get into the first one. So this book does not have a consistent narrator like a lot of other books. It is told there are three perspectives, POVs, that you get to see. So you get to see Zelly's point of view, you also get to see Amari's point of view, and you also get to see Amari's brother's Prince uh, Einan's point of view as well. And they all have a distinctive voice. That being said, I'm a fan of the Game of Thrones novels, or the Song of Ice and Fire novels, I guess. And so... If you've read those novels, you know that these point of views, um, you have you have your favorites, and then you have the ones that you're like, I wish I could skip you, but you probably want to contain a lot of uh, important information. And that's also the case in uh, this book. Zelly is a really, really good main character. She is likable, she is funny, she is strong, she's powerful, she feels all these great emotions, and it kind of stinks that she is kind of often sandwiched between Amari and uh, Enan's chapters because they're both kind of wet blankets. Um, Amari is a spoiled, pampered princess, and she's trying to do good by the people who live in her country, but at the same point, she often doesn't participate a lot in the action, and Einan is goes from his chapters tend to be either very good or incredibly moody and like I hate you, Dad, those sorts of things. So that can get kind of annoying at times. So the other major aspect of the book that I haven't mentioned, and I feel a little guilty about saving it to kind of the last part of the review, but it's it's big and it's it's something that I didn't really know how to incorporate in, into the talk about the plot and, and those sorts of things. And that is the fact that every single character in this book is a person of color, specifically 
pretty much everybody is black and that is kind of a huge deal in the terms of uh, fantasy literature especially high fantasy literature like the children of blood and bone would pretty much be considered to be because um most of the time that genre is dominated by dudes and specifically white dudes and so tomi adayame is a black author and it's kind of refreshing to see her take on this genre because we aren't we just haven't had a lot of experience with it and i feel kind of strange being in 2019 stating that you know this uh this book is a completely all black cast and talking about it and acknowledging it because at this point you would think that it would just be something that is obvious but it's it's not so it's good to mention that being said does this perspective of this all black cast add anything to the story and that's an emphatic yes there are a couple of things that i don't think could be done if th- if this perspective wasn't there and particularly if it wasn't black women at the center of the story. So one of the things that uh, was pretty powerful early on in the book is there was a little bit of a discussion about Amari. Uh, Amari is the princess of this um, noble land, but at the same time, she's kind of discriminated against as well by the other nobles. And the reason for that is she is described as having a very dark complexion, and a lot of the nobles strive to have a lighter complexion. So it talks about complexion in terms of darkness, darkness being construed by a lot of the nobles as being ugly, poor, feral, and lightness being considered uh, beauteous, and and those sorts of things. It's interesting because those are talks that we have in our own community as well in, in this world. The other thing is there is a lot of discussion about hair. If it's not obvious, um... I'm a, I'm a white dude, um, so I am not really equipped necessarily to have this full discussion about hair, about complexion, those sorts of things. I'm trying my best, but I'm I'm going to be honest that I I don't necessarily have the authority or the language nece- necessarily to talk about it, but I am an ally. <laughs> so anyway, there there there's a lot of discussion about hair in this book as well. Um magi hair to be exact. So when the magi do not have their powers, they have this long white straight hair and as soon as they get their power, it begins to become kind of curly, more thick, more bouncy. <laughs> there, there's a lot of uh, language to describe it in the book, and I, I can see that there's some parallels there between natural hair uh, in the black community and things like weaves and, and those sorts of things. Uh, the long white hair is like pretty much described as like being unnatural, like not living when the magi don't have their power, and then when they get their powers back and they they're starting to be more attuned with their true nature, their hair changes. And I, I definitely think that there is some commentary there as well. The other, the other thing is that Tomi Adeyemi, uh, in her author's note, said that she wrote this book or got the inspiration to write this book uh, during a time when it seemed like every time we turned on the nightly news, there was another news story about a unarmed black man being shot by a police officer and there is certainly parallels that could be made between the treatment of the magi and the treatment by the the king's guards and and those sorts of things and some of the language that is used they're often called maggots by the non-magical folk and so there are definitely some connections there. There are certain scenes between characters that I'm not necessarily going into that are very reminiscent of some of the some of those scenes that you would see on on the news in in, in real life here. So if those kinds of things are upsetting to you, I still think you should read the book, but it's important to be forewarned about that. So overall, I would say that this is one of the best fantasy books released in quite some time, and it is something that I would recommend anybody who is a fan of fantasy, because it just is such a different perspective on the genre. And I'm looking forward to the sequel uh, book, which is actually going to come out, um, like, I think in a month as of this recording, if not in in a couple of months, And and I would like to see more 
perspective like this in the genre of fantasy. So, uh, that is the podcast for this week. Like I said, you can reach us at reviewingtherealms at gmail.com, tweet at us at realmsreviewing, or uh, follow the Instagram or Facebook page. Uh, Those would both be under uh, Reviewing the Realms. If you follow the Instagram page, you will see pictures of books that are either going to be the next episode or something that will be in the future. And the Facebook page will just give you some updates on the show as as they happen, there's also a website through WordPress, reviewingtherealms.blog, I believe, and that will be a home for all of the reviews as they come out. But we are available now on iTunes, Google Play, uh, Spotify, CastBox, all of these different podcast applications. I've tried to be as proactive about adding uh, them to different podcast aggregators as possible, so that you can get the best listening experience. So uh, that is it for this week, and I am Zach, and I am signing out.